Hello and welcome to Chapter 4, Medical, Legal, and Ethical Issues um, Lecture. And upon completion of this chapter and the related coursework, you will understand laws and ethics applicable to pre-hospital emergency care. You will be able to differentiate among personal, professional, and medical ethics, including the role of each in providing pre-hospital care. You will be familiar with the United States legal system in terms specific to criminal, civil, and employment law relevant to the paramedic and EMS system. You will also be able to describe legal accountability of a paramedic as a professional healthcare provider and be able to explain expectations of the paramedic in patient encounters as it relates to consent and treatment of the patient, including how to protect against negligence claims. Okay, so let's get started with the chapter. Medical professionals provide care under a set of laws affecting how patients must be treated. Ethics are principles, personal and social, that determine what is right and wrong, and laws have sanctions for violations that are enforceable, define the obligations of paramedics, and protect our rights and the rights of others. They may be set forth by either or both of the federal or state government, impacting a paramedic responding to an emergency. So there are motor vehicle laws, EMS legislation, medical licensing statutes and regulations, civil and criminal statutes, and confidentiality laws such as the HIPAA, um, which is Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Basic understanding of laws and ethics applicable to pre-hospital care, failing to perform your job within the law can result in civil and criminal liability, and practicing outside of the law can result in regulatory action or action by your agency and medical director. An EMS provider can be prosecuted in any or all of the jurisdictions for the same case. So ethics, it's the branch of philosophy that deals with the study of distinction between right and wrong and the way these concepts are applied. Applied ethics refers to the use of ethical values. Okay, so there's text as a framework to help you develop legal understanding. Laws and legal obligations differ among states. And contact an attorney who specializes in representing medical professionals if you need legal advice. Okay, so next we're going to talk about medical ethics. And these are personal ethics are the product of your upbringing, family, community, and religion. Professional ethics arise out of standards and practices of your profession the Code of Professional Contact, Conduct, and State and Federal Laws. In cases where your personal ethics conflict with your professional ethical standards, you must temporarily set aside your personal ethics, um, put them aside. The interests of your patient must take precedence over your personal beliefs. Sometimes called bioethics, medical ethics are related to the practice and delivery of healthcare. Your understanding of medical ethics must be consistent with general codes of the healthcare professional. Many ethical codes for healthcare professionals have existed throughout history. The Declaration of Geneva. It was drafted by the World Medical Association in 1948. It's taken by medical students upon completion of their studies when they are about to enter the medical profession. Refer to page 97 of the text to review a copy of this oath. Also, the Code of Ethics for EMS Practitioners. It's issued by the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians in 1978. It's still in use today. And under this code, the emergency medical technician pledges to conserve life, alleviate suffering, and promote health, provide services based on human need with respect for dignity, unrestricted by considerations of nationality, race, creed, and status, not use personal knowledge and skill in a way detrimental to public good, respect and hold in confidence all information obtained in the course of professional work unless required by law, understand and uphold the laws of citizenship, particularly when working with other citizens and healthcare professionals in promoting efforts to meet the health needs of the public, maintain personal, competence and demonstrate concerns for the competence of other members of the medical profession. Assume responsibility. 
have the responsibility to participate in study of an action on matters of legislation affecting the profession and emergency services to the public adhere to standards of personal ethics and reflect credit upon the profession, contribute to reason in relation to a commercial product or service, but not lend a to professional status to advertising promotional sales, advertise professional services within the com conformity and dignity of the profession, not delegate a service to a person less qualified, and refuse to participate in unethical procedures and assume responsibility to expose incompetent or unethical conduct in others to appropriate authorities. Varying codes of ethics, policies, and rules for EMS professionals by state service or company. The eye care program. This was developed by a group of EMS students and educators. It incorporates many of the finest qualities of EMS professionals. I care stands for integrity, compassion, accountability, respect, and empathy. Incorporate I care into the care you provide to your patients. Ultimately, these codes stem from a concern for patient welfare. If you prioritize patient welfare, you will rarely, if any, commit an unethical act. Regardless of the uh, ethical circumstances you may encounter, apply three basic ethical concepts when making a decision. The first one is to do no harm. The second one is to act in good faith. The third is to act in the patient's best interest. So let's talk about the first one. To do no harm. First, do no harm. This means take all due care to ensure your patient receives the best po possible care and your actions do not harm the patient. In assessment, treatment, and transport to avoid, to avoid exacerbating the illness or injury. The second one is to act in good faith. The third one is to act in the patient's best interest. So acting in good faith and in the patient's best interest go hand in hand. Reinforce your commitment to place interests of the patient above all else and make decisions motivated by a clear desire to benefit your patient. So paramedics must be accountable for their actions at all times. Your behavior on the job and the way you handle situations will shape your career. Choose a mentor whose style and professionalism you wish to emulate. Professional ethics are extremely important. Ethics are especially important as EMS continues to seek funding and recognition similar to other medical professionals. Immature, unprofessional behavior is unacceptable. Criminal acts are unethical and illegal. Negative publicity lessens the public's confidence in the service you provide, and you should never falsify training records or falsely represent your level of certification. Always be respectful of patients. Never do anything to violate their trust in you as a professional and avoid misconduct that could question your ethics or integrity. The ethics of your person profession require a total commitment to acting in the best interests of your patient. Do not overlook other providers who engage in misbehavior. Report it to the appropriate chain of command and report medical errors you make or witness to your medical director as soon as possible. The most successful and fulfilled paramedics choose to become patient advocates participate in and actively seek out the best training and professional development, and put the good of the team above their own personal aspirations. You are responsible for the future of EMS. Ethics applies to EMS research as well. So EMS practitioners have largely evolved from grassroots efforts. Properly randomized controlled studies are not common, but they are emerging so remember, the first principle of medical practice is to do no harm. Seek, continue to seek further education about the effectiveness of the EMS practice. EMS care relies on antidotal experience that is unsupported by research. So some procedures prove not be helpful to patients. You should act on those recommendations as well. Conducting studies on critically ill or injured patients without their informed consent is a true ethical dilemma. 
make yourself aware of how researchers are handling ethical debates concerning patients in research. Okay, so the legal system in the United States. Passage, administration, and interpretation of federal and state laws affecting paramedics. So the legislative branch is composed of elected officials, Congress and state legislators that make laws. The judicial branch is composed of the court system. It enforces and interprets laws. It resolves disputes based on the interpretation of laws. Common law is defined as a decision that has been made by a judge through a court base on his or her interpretation of the statutes and constitutions. A number of court um, levels, so examples there are trial and appellate, and precedence of the law of the state in which the paramedics practice. In most cases, court decisions established standard of negligence. And then there's the executive branch or the administrative branch. This reports directly to the president or the governor. It's composed of cabinets and agencies or bureaucrats that carry out and administer laws, often use regulations to establish how things should be done. For example, the U.S. Department of Transportation at the federal level. Your responsibility to know and understand your state's laws and administration regulations that affect your practice. So let's talk about the types of laws next. Civil and criminal law govern paramedics in court. Under civil law, a patient can sue you for a perceived injury. Criminal law allows the state to prosecute a paramedic for breaking a legal statute, and malpractice suits are tried under civil law. They may be based on statutes, but also uh, claims usually arise from uh, principles of negligence. And cases of medication misuse are usually tried under criminal law. Most civil law is concerned with establishing liability, or otherwise known as responsibility. The judicial process determines who is responsible when a person is injured and seeks redress. So citizens have a constitutional right to take legal action against a medical provider they believe provided inadequate care. However, they must prove that the medical provider was negligent. Um, actionable cause could lead to a civil lawsuit. So legal action instituted by a private person or entity the defendant is the person or entity against whom a legal action is brought, and tort is the wrongful act that gives rise to a civil suit. There are two classifications of tort. There's unintentional, which is negligence, and intentional, where there is intent to cause harm. The purpose of a civil suit is usually compensation, or otherwise known as damages, for injury the plaintiff sustained. In most medical liability cases, the plaintiff seeks compensation for physical suffering, mental anguish, medical bills, and lost earnings. The court may also award punitive damage if the misconduct was intentional or constituted a disregard for public safety. To succeed in a civil suit, the plaintiff needs to show a majority of evidence favors his or her position. The plaintiff must convince the jury of his or her position. Most EMS lawsuits result from emergency vehicle crashes, so safe driving is key to preventing lawsuits. Crashes cause expensive damage and serious harm to providers, patients, and bystanders. Other kinds of lawsuits against EMS providers are on the rise, though. Many involve dispatch and transport issues. So example of this would be a delayed transport response, patient deterioration after not being transported. Others involve the quality of medical care provided by the EMS providers, especially paramedics, and sometimes the same act that sparks a civil suit may elicit criminal prosecution. So criminal prosecution is an action taken by the government against a person the prosecutors feel has violated criminal laws. The government must prove guilt beyond all reasonable doubt to the jury. If found guilty, the defendant can be fined, imprisoned, or both. Okay, so next let's talk about criminal laws, which are most likely to apply to pre-hospital care. And some examples of these include assault, battery, and false imprisonment or kidnapping. 
Now, assault is when a person, let's say the EMS provider, instills the fear of immediate body, bodily harm or breach of body security to another person, um, and that would be the patient, regardless of whether the threat of harm is uh, actually carried out. So an example would be threatening to restrain a patient. That is assault. Now, battery is when the defendant, so let's say the EMS provider, touches a person, the patient, without his or her consent. So an example of this would be to distinguish the difference uh, saying, I'm going to kick your teeth in. That's assault or actually kicking in a teeth is battery. So false imprisonment is when a person is unintentionally and unjustifiably detained against his or her will. Some examples would be if a paramedic transports a patient without his or her consent or uses restraints in a wrongful manner. Any act of medical treatment performed without consent may be considered assault or battery or both. In criminal cases, the prosecution needs to prove there was intent to do harm. In civil cases, the plaintiff needs to establish that the conduct took place without his or her consent. Criminal charges of false imprisonment or kidnapping are rarely filed. In civil suits, alleging false imprisonment or kidnapping are more common. Usually they arise from patients' claims of transport or restraint against his or her will. And paramedics may be sued for defamation as well. So defamation is intentionally making a false statement through written or verbal communication that inquire, injures a person's good name or reputation. Liable means making a false statement in written form that injures a person's good name. When written, the patient in the patient report, avoid using terms that may be considered insulting or offensive. For example, the patient appears to be drunk. Think of how that report would read in court. Thoughtless comments may be used as evidence against you. Slander means verbally making a false statement that injures a person's good name. So avoid using terms that could be considered offensive when transferring patient care. So next we're going to talk about the legal process. A civil lawsuit begins when a dissatisfied patient contacts an attorney who then files a document for a lawsuit with a local court. The complaint contains general allegations against the paramedic and the EMS system, but may not contain specific information about what the patient thinks went wrong. The patient's attorney must deliver a copy of the complaint and the summons to the person involved in the lawsuit. From start to finish, the lawsuit may take several years. Normally, an attorney will be assigned to you by the insurance company that handles the claims for your employer. The complaint will be filed and your attorney will answer. Then the discovery period begins. This can last a few months or more than two years. Attorneys on both sides seek as much information about the case as possible. The following may take place. The exchange of written questions, which must be answered under oath. The exchange of documents and then dispositions, which are statements taken under oath. Stay in touch with your attorney during this time and your attorney will prepare you for depositions by telling you where to go and what to wear and how to respond to certain types of questions. Attorneys may also file motions and argue them before the judge. Most civil cases are resolved during a settlement process. Taking a case through trial is expensive and time consuming and settlement involves both parties and their attorneys in mediation and arbitration. If the case cannot be resolved during the settlement, it will proceed to trial. The paramedic and the medical director. So the relationship between the paramedic and the medical director is complex. Ultimately, the paramedic has three lines of authority to answer to within the EMS system. So the medical director, the licensing agency, and the employer. There may be some overlap, but these distinctions are important. Usually state EMS legislation requires the paramedic to perform advanced life support procedures and skills only under physician supervision. So legislation may also require a medical director. The acts of the paramedic are not the actions of the physician. However, the medical director can be accountable for failing to supervise closely or take action when the paramedic is not meeting the standards. 
A medical director may do any of the following if he or she does not believe the paramedic is performing the standards. So they may restrict the paramedic's practice, withdraw supervision entirely, require remedial training. So medical directors are not responsible for an employer's disciplinary actions. Many paramedics' activities require an order from a physician. So orders may be given on radio or by cell phone, and that you know that that's online medical control. And orders may be defined by protocols or standing orders, and that's offline medical control. Paramedics cannot disregard or reverse a physician's order unless carrying out the order will harm the patient. Paramedics may be at the scene of the emergency with an inexperienced physician. So paramedics may feel the orders of the physician are inappropriate. Disregarding orders from a physician takes, physician places a paramedic on questionable legal ground. Ask the service medical director to develop protocols in advance. And the physician is not required to ride to the hospital with the EMS unless procedures have been performed above the EMS provider's level of training or the physician has assumed responsibility for patient care. Ensure the physician is licensed in your state and continue, or document the physician's name and contact information prior to patient care. Conflicts should be resolved by online medical control. So let's talk about EMS enabling legislation. This defines how EMS is structured. It designates responsibilities to government agencies and provides framework for the paramedics practice, what is permitted in the field. So for example, it defines the need for the medical director. It defines the scope of practice for the different levels of EMS personnel. And it leads to regulations that paramedics should be familiar with. And then there's administrative regulations. So these are set forth by bureaucracies at the state and federal levels. They affect and define the specific rules under which paramedics practice. So for example, regulations may set out precise skills and medications to be used by each level of EMS provider, usually developed by state department of health or county agency responsible for regulating EMS practice, may further define the paramedic's role in patient care, and they may define the requirement for licensing and renewal and continuing education. The action against the paramedic's license for providing less than adequate care for failing to meet the requirements for recertification and serious consequences for failure to abide by these regulations. And then there's licensing and certification. So these terms are often confused. Paramedics are considered licensed in some states, but in others they are considered certified. Certification is the level of credentials based on hours of training and competency, which may be granted by the governmental agency or by a private organization. Certification does not mean someone has the authority to practice the skills in that certification. Licensure permits a carefully defined level of practice usually granted by an agency or local authority. A license is a privilege granted by the governmental authority on certain conditions. The paramedic must comply with the government re requirements of or risk losing their license. So they must have uh, professional behavior, continuing education, and licensure renewal. Rights and privileges conferred by licensing in one state may not be conferred on other states that certify rather than licensed paramedics. Credentialing may be encountered by the paramedic as well. So discipline and due process. Paramedics who commit an infraction to licensure rules may have their license restricted, suspended, or revoked by a granting agency. Administrative agencies can propose a license action, licensing action called due process. And so what due process is, it's a right to a fair procedure for the action the agency proposes to take. And there are two components. You have to be, have the notice and the opportunity to be heard. The paramedic is notified by receipt of a certified letter of the notice of action. The letter informs him or her of the action to be taken and the regulations the agency is alleging were violated. So let's talk about the Medical Practice Act next. And this enables physicians and other healthcare practitioners to function. 
The Medical Practice Act defines the minimal qualifications of those who perform various health services and the skills that each type of practitioner is legally permitted to use. It may contain requirements for relicensure or recertification based on continuing education, and it may require a physician to assume responsibility for um, competency of the paramedics, so the training, the skills, the in review run, and it varies from state to state. And then there's the scope of practice. So the scope of practice may be spelled out in your state's EMS legislation or regulations. The scope of practice is care that a paramedic is permitted to perform occurring to the state under his or her license or certification. The medical director might not permit a paramedic to perform all the skills or give all the medications for which the paramedic is licensed or certified. A paramedic carrying out procedures outside his or her scope of practice may be considered for negligence or criminal offense. So scope of practice should not be confused with standard of care. Standard of care is what a reasonable paramedic would do in a similar situation. And then there's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And you wanna be very familiar with this. This is otherwise known as HIPAA. This provides stringent privacy requirements for patient information. It was enacted in 1996, and it provides for criminal sanctions as well as civil penalties for releasing a patient's private medical information to an, in an unauthorized manner. HIPAA privacy rules are the most relevant part of HIPAA for health care providers. They're enforced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. They establish what is considered to be the person's protected health information, and the medical information can also be dis disclosed by, if necessary, for a patient's treatment to receive payment for billing and if release has been authorized in writing by the patient or lawful patient representative. It requires each agency to have a privacy officer and awareness of the location of the patient information, casual discussion about patient where the conversation may be overheard. So use caution when giving records or discussing patient information in public areas. Um, liability of sharing the patient's stories and caution during ride-along situations. Patients entitled to a copy of their service per, um, privacy policies, so they may, may be difficult in an emergency setting, but they're obligated to do your best to follow comp compliance with the law. Most services make up leaflets, state laws pertaining to patient confidentiality, and there's a code of ethics for emergency medical techs and confidentiality. So it's issued by the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians. So release of medical information without the patient's authorization. It's legally mandated reporting. There are dog bites, gunshot wounds, or child abuse. Authorized data collection, research for public health agencies, authorized requests by law enforcement, information required to be disclosed um, persistent to a valid subpoena or exchange of health information for a medical need. So it's allowed and is necessary. HIPAA implications for electronic communication. So some agencies prohibit EMS providers from carrying camera enabled mobile phones while on duty ensures everyone on the call understands the patient information should never be posted on any social media network. And it ensures no patient identifiers are present if an emergency scene is captured in any photographs or videos. The safeguard principle of HIPAA requires that reasonable administration, technical and physical safeguards be put into place to aid the protection of patient information. Knowledge of HIPAA rules and regulations by all agencies involve your agency's um, privacy provider can help you better understand all the rules and regulations associated with HIPAA and your role in EMS. Okay, so then there's the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, and this was established in 1986. It combats the practice of patient dumping. So when a hospital emergency department denies medical screening or stabilizing treatment, or inappropriately transfers a person who is not stable, 
Historically, it's occurred when the hospital discovered that the patient did not have health insurance and was unable to pay. So economic triage is a practice of making health care decisions based on the ability of the patient or the insurance carrier to provide payment for services. So paramedics have been accused of providing a lower standard of care for indigent persons or those on public assistance. So understand local protocols require or regarding hospital to transfer patients. Rural hospitals may have limited choices and other places may have several options. So some systems require patients to be transported to the nearest hospital. The paramedic may be required to consult with medical control and um, issues severe fines for hospitals and doctors who violate the provisions and issues are regulated by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is emergency vehicle laws. And most states have specific statutes that define an emergency vehicle and what traffic should do when the emergency vehicle approaches. But the laws vary from state to state. And emergency vehicles, they must be operated in a safe manner. The laws do not authorize speeding, running red lights, or driving the vehicle in an unsafe manner if any of those activities put the public at unreasonable risk. State laws establish higher standards for the operator. In a crash, often the EMS provider will be found at fault in a civil case against the driver. The driver may be charged criminally. Know the laws of state about emergency vehicle operation. The blue star of life and the flashing red lights do not exempt you from defensive driving and common courtesy. Emergency vehicle operators are professionally trained to operate vehicles safely at all times and to anticipate reactions of other drivers in stressful situations. A collision could result in injuries and or delayed patient treatment. And then transportation. So patients should be transported to the hospital of their choice. Most EMS systems have protocols to transport certain types of patients to particular hospitals. So for example, a trauma, stroke, or cardiac event, maybe homeless patients, mentally ill patients, or obese patients. The capacity of each hospital should guide the EMS system in delivering or developing the transport protocols. Paramedics who have decided not to transport patients have been the subject of litigation. Studies have demonstrated that paramedics should not decide which patients need to be transported to the hospital for any health problems. The whole EMS system does not have access to sophisticated diagnostic tools or radiography in a pre-hospital setting. And crime scenes and emergency scene responsibilities. So when handling a situation involving death or a potential crime scene, it may take law enforcement officials time to figure out whether the scene involved a suicide, homicide, or some other form of criminal activity. So use extreme caution and do not disturb evidence or destroy any potential evidence. So if the scene is a vehicle crash, do not move anything unless you have to, including broken glass or pieces of metal. If the scene is indoors, try not to touch anything that you do not have to for the risk of eliminating fingerprints, such as telephones or doorknobs. Document statements made by witnesses and get their contact info. Limit the number of EMS personnel to enter the scene. Notify law enforcement personnel if furniture or other objects need to be moved. And do not alter evidence on the clothing. In cases of sexual assault, the patient may carry vital pieces of evidence. So for example, fibers or hair or blood. In the event of death at the scene, stay with the body until the police arrive. Protect the scene from contamination by bystanders and family members. In most jurisdictions, the paramedic is not legally authorized to pronounce a patient dead. Um, when in doubt about the possibility of saving the patient, initiate resuscitation. And mandatory reporting. In each state has its own requirements for reporting to authorities. Every state has laws requiring EMS to report child and elder abuse, so become familiar with the reporting requirements of the state in which you're employed. The obligation to report is frequently applied to neglect or abuse of children, neglect or abuse of older people, 
domestic violence, injury from a felony, drug-related injuries, rape, animal bites, or certain communicable diseases. And then the coroner and medical examiner cases. So EMS agencies have a list of procedures that involve the coroner or medical examiner. Generally, the police should be notified in all cases. So obvious homicides or suicides, violent or sudden unexpected death, or death of a prison inmate. Okay, so paramedic and patient relationships. Most important role in medical care is do what is best for the patients. Paramedics are trained in emergency medical care, not law. Every decision should be based on the standards of good medical care, not on the possibility of legal consequence. So doing what is best for the patient will avoid problems with the law. Consent and refusal. So obtain consent of the patient prior to providing emergency medical care. Consent refers to the patient who are of legal ages and possess decision-making capacity making medical care decisions for themselves. There are two types of consent. There is informed consent and implied consent, and we're going to talk about those next. So informed consent must be obtained from every adult patient who has decision-making capacity. A number of things may impede you giving patients what they need to make decisions, though. There may be a language barrier or an emotional state or the mental ability. Ensure the patient understands that you are what you are trying to do and grant you permission to treat. Informed consent may lack formality in the hospital. So document the patient's consent to provide yourself against potential legal action. Informed consent is routinely obtained verbally. It may also be communicated through the patient conduct, so rolling up sleeve to allow for a blood pressure check. And then there's express consent, so when the patient demonstrates he or she is giving you permission to provide care. All right, so then there's implied consent. And implied consent is a form of consent assumed to be given by an unconscious patient or those who are too ill or injured to consent verbally to emergency life-saving treatment. Assume the patient would want care due to the severity of the condition. So if the patient exhibits signs that he or she does not have the decision-making capacity, treat the patient under implied consent. So these might be like mental illness or shock or stress, confusion or head injury. Some EMS personnel incorrectly use the term involuntary consent. So this term is incorrectly used in situations where law enforcement officer or legal guardian grants permission to treat someone who is under arrest, incapacitated, or a minor, or for, those, for some other reason. So it is actually an oxymoron. Consent can neither never be involuntary. Persons under arrest or person uh, in prison, they do not necessarily lose the right to be involved in the medical decisions. It is not uncommon for law enforcement or direct EMS personnel to treat a person under arrest. So medical control should be involved if the prisoner refuses treatment. And do not assume that law enforcement officer or anyone else has the right to refuse treatment for a patient. Okay, so next we're going to talk about decision-making capacity. Refusals must be informed. The same prerequisites as consent apply. So decision-making capacity is the ability of the patient to understand the information that is being provided to them and make a choice regarding appropriate medical care. The best tool to evaluate a patient decision-making capacity is the ability to talk to the patient to see if he or she understands what is happening to him or her. If a pulse ox or blood glucose measurement are outside of normal ranges, these can provide information about the patient's ability to understand and communicate. Include detailed documentation of decision-making capacity in the patient care report. If the patient with decision-making capacity refuses medical care, the person may not be treated without a court order. So consult with medical control for instructions, inform the patient in a calm and sympathetic manner of the potential consequences of refusing treatment. Remember, Many people who refuse medical care do so out of fear and emotional distress. It is not uncommon for patients to refuse treatment and transport to the hospital due to cost, the cost of the ambulance and the cost of um, hospital treatment. 
So addressing these concerns can be challenging, and situations like this may require all of your people skills. A patient may be alert and oriented, but still incapable of making an informed decision, even after you have communicated with him or her to the best of your ability. Then many factors may prevent the patient from making an informed refusal, such as a head injury or altered mental status or unstable vital signs. Contact medical control for guidance and consider calling for assistance or law enforcement. So psychiatric emergencies present problems of consent. A police officer is generally the only person given authority to restrain and transport a patient against his or her will. EMS should not do so unless at the express request of police. EMS service must establish protocol based on local laws dealing with mentally disturbed patients who refuse transport, and police may be required. The role of each agency involved should be clearly defined beforehand. If you believe that a patient is not competent to make the reasonable decision regarding his or her care and the treatment is necessary, it is better to treat the patient. Some patients refuse treatment as a way to deny they have a problem. So for example, a middle-aged man with chest pain refuses treatment in order to deny he's having a heart attack. Patients speaking with medical control by radio or telephone may be helpful. So maintain a courteous and sympathetic attitude. Let the patient know your chief concern and is his or her well-being. And tell the patient it's okay if you change your mind. Urge the patient to seek further medical evaluation from a physician of their choice. And help the patient make concrete plans for follow-up. Some patients will consent to treatment but not transport. And the opposite. Some people will, some people, patients will consent to transport but not treatment. So document the patient refusals is critical. Litigation may arise and the patient may claim you committed abandonment. So document all findings of your assessment and the patient's mental status carefully. Okay, the report should be signed and pre-hospital refusal forms must be backed up with action. So legally, you must have undertaken the process of attempting to obtain informed consent to treat the patient. The patient's signature on the refusal form does not mean the patient has given informed consent. You must inform the patient of what you propose to do, including the potential risk of refusing care and providing the information in the manner the patient can understand. A patient refusing care can be difficult for the paramedic, but the patient's rights must be respected regardless of your beliefs or what you think you should be doing. Courts have upheld patient refusals when paramedics documented a patient's decision-making capacity. Okay, then there's minors. So minors present special issues for a medic as well. Minors have no legal status and they cannot refuse or consent to medical care. Consent must be obtained from the parent or medical or legal guardian of the children or adults who have legal guardians. So be aware of the legal principle in loco parentis. So in loco parentis means in place of parent, and it may apply to school or daycare or summer camp. Decisions by the school administrators or daycare directors on behalf of the minor. Difficult circumstances may arise if the parent or legal guardian refuses to grant consent to the minor who clearly requires life-saving or limb-saving treatment. Adults have the right to refuse treatment. State laws generally do not permit a parent or guardian to deny treatment for a minor child, but the failure to allow treatment may constitute neglect. The paramedic should notify law enforcement or medical control, and state law may permit the state to assume custody of the child. Emancipated minors are under the legal age in a given state, but can be treated as a legal adult due to qualifying circumstances. Um, circumstances. So individual state laws determines the circumstances, but in most states they recognize any minor who has been emancipated by a court order. In some states um, there's criteria. So if the marriage or pregnancy or active military service, emancipated minors may be treated as adults when obtaining consent or refusal. Okay, so violent patients and restraints. So the use of force by paramedics can be the case of many lawsuits. 
force can only be used in response to a patient's use of force against you. So if you're attacked, you may be able to defend yourself. And the use of temporary disabling sprays, knives, or firearms are usually prohibited by the EMS agency. The amount of force allowed by law is either equal or slightly greater than the force offered by the patient. Violence against EMS providers is on a rise, but do not enter a scene that is unsafe. Let law enforcement secure that scene. Restraint can be used for medical reasons only when the patient is a danger to himself or others. So violence can be a result of a medical reason such as hypoxia or hypoglycemia, mental illness, or brain injury. Okay, so negligence and protection against negligence claims. No protection from liability or gross negligence other than immunity. So negligence occurs when the paramedic or EMS system had the legal du duty to the patient. So for example, a paramedic is hired to serve the community, has the legal duty to the citizens of that community. There is a breach of duty when the person accused of negligence failed to act as another person with similar training would have acted under the same or similar circumstances. The failure to act appropriately was the approximate cause of the plaintiff's injury and harm resulted. A paramedic and the EMS systems are protected from liability as long as they perform according to the standards for paramedics and EMS systems. The best protection is to ha behave in circumstances according to established procedures and standards set by national agencies. These standards are not law, but can be introduced as evidence in litigation. They may affect the outcome of the lawsuit. Ensure your vehicles maintain an optimal condition and equip the vehicle according to prevailing standards. Paramedics may obtain their own insurance coverage in addition to their employers to provide for additional protection. Having additional insurance provides protection if your employer's insurance carrier is required to pay out a claim based on wrongdoing for which you're responsible or if you're sued as a result of having provided off-duty emergency assistance. One aspect of negligence is foreseeability. So this implies that the injury or harm could have been predicted. Avoid if proper precautions were taken. So for example, giving an incorrect dosage of a drug will foreseeably result in harm of the patient. Negligence is divided into three categories. So there's malfeasance, misfeasance, and nonfeasance. So malfeasance. When the paramedic performs an act that he or she was never authorized to do. So for example, a medical intervention outside the scope of practice. Misfeasance. When the paramedic performs an act that he or she is legally permitted to do, but improperly carries it out. And then non-feasance, that's when the paramedic fails to perform an act that he or she is required or expected to perform. So failure to perform CPR when the patient's in cardiac arrest is an example. Okay. And then there's elements of neglect. So you have a duty, it's prescribed by the law, what you must do and how you must do it. The first duty is to do no further harm. We've talked about that. A successful lawsuit is a breach of duty, um, proof of the duty. So a duty is an obligation to which law will give recognition and con effect and confirm to a particular standard of conduct together. So um, confusion around the concept of legal duty in EMS. So there's an here's an example. Mer many paramedics think that there is that they are legally obligated to stop at roadside crashes because they are paramedics. In most, uh, in all but few states, this is not the case. Obligation to respond to calls when working on shift or volunteering for a squad. So most services have a policy addressing the passing by of another accident while en route to a call or to a hospital with a patient. Make sure the appropriate personnel are dispatched. Common misconceptions are a requirement to stop at all emergencies due to the paramedic sticker on your personal vehicle. There's a legal duty to perform within the standard of care if the decision is made to stop 
but further legal duty not to abandon a patient once the treatment has began. But legal obligations when off duty, usually not. There are state laws and education of peers regarding off duty obligations, but um, legal duty of EMS agencies, though, agencies have a duty to respond to calls for aid. The use of mutual resources um, appropriately if call volume is heavy. And the concept in the law that tells you what your standards of practice are. So often defined in the context of a case tried in a court of law. Okay, so another element of negligence is the breach of duty. And a lawsuit will be successful if the paramedic failed to perform within the standard of care. A jury will listen to a testimony of an expert witness on both sides. And the jury will decide whether the paramedic's care was reasonable or not. The expert witness will provide sources including their own training, the paramedic textbook, protocols, national standards, SOPs, and the patient care report. Good documentation will help provide your standard of care or prove your standard of care. Some states differ between ordinary negligence and gross negligence, okay? So some states follow a gross negligence standard. And lawsuits against paramedics will not be successful unless the paramedic was seriously departed from acceptable standards. And approximate cause. So um, approximate cause applies in cases where the paramedic has a legal duty to the patient and breaches that standard of care. And so the plaintiff must link the act that fell between the standard of care directly to his or her injury by showing that the act or failure to act um, approximately caused the harm. So an example is a paramedic treating a patient with a spinal cord injury. The paramedic drops the stretcher or the patient may try to show that his or her injury resulted from the drop stretcher and careful documentation of the patient's status at their first encounter will be essential to the defense. And then harm. The final element plaintiffs must prove in the negligence lawsuit. In addition to physical injury, patients can claim damages for emotional distress, loss of income, loss of enjoyment of life, loss of household services, and loss of future earning capacity. Plaintiff will need to show the paramedic's actions were proximate causes of each of these losses. And then there's abandonment. So abandonment is a form of neglect that involves the termination of care without the patient's consent. Abandonment implies the patient had continuing need for medical treatment and the abrupt termination of the treatment caused injury or death. You may not leave the patient in need of medical treatment until another competent healthcare professional with equal or higher level of training has taken responsibility. And you must notify an appropriate healthcare professional of the patient's presence in the emergency department. Notify the person that, is, that you're transferring responsibility to care to him or her. You have to complete a written report and often submitted it electronically frequently submitted it after the call and received by the ED physician or nurse, the report will be permanent um, in their uh, uh, records. So some situations may not require transport but are not considered abandonment. So frequent calls for patients who do not really need treatment or transport. Many have fallen and just need help up. Patients may need help taking meds or patients with hypoglycemia may feel fine after the treatment. So some ambulance services have a mix of providers of various training and service may not have a full staff at all times. The paramedic may not need to be part of the transport crew if the patient does not need advanced care. And some systems have tiered responses. So they might have basic life support providers reach them quickly and then advanced life support providers follow. Okay, let's talk about patient's autonomy next. So the patient's right to direct their own care make end of life decisions. So the patient's autonomy and medical ethics does not apply when the patient is a minor or lacks decision making capacity. 
in the patient's decision. So decisions may not be accepted by other members of public or the patient's family. It's important to remember that in courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court, they have recognized the right of people to make their own decisions about their medical care. So people make their own decisions even if it means death. Ethics has become the subject of many paramedic discussions. The paramedic find themselves being accountable to more systems than the average healthcare provider in trying to respect the wishes of the patient. Okay, so um, competing interests can create an ethical conflict. Physician's orders. So you may feel that they are detrimental to the patient's best interests. Immediately discuss your feelings with the physician. You are in a better situation to understand your job is to communicate fully with that physician. Never perform a procedure or administer a med that you feel um, or believe will harm the patient. For example, if the physician asks you to perform a procedure in which you are not trained, obtain clarification from the physician and communicate your objections. Discuss your current standing orders and offer a feasible alternative within your scope of practice. Act in the patient's best interest as his or her advocate. All right, now we're going to start talking about advanced directives. And these are usually a written document, and it can be an oral statement, though. Um, some examples are living wills or DNRs or organ donations, and they differ from state to state. And a DNR order may restrict advanced life support care. State law covers whether EMS personnel are bound by advanced directives, and those that cover DNR orders are usually very strict, though. Learn and follow the laws in your state, and state law provides a framework for your decisions. Okay, so now we're going to go through some of the um, advanced directives, and uh, the first one we're going to talk about is the living will and the health care power of attorney. So living will and health care power of attorney, these are types of advanced directives. A patient can express wishes regarding end-of-life medical care. And these are sometimes called healthcare durable power of attorneys. These documents can sometimes be confusing, and there are various types of powers of attorneys. Older patients commonly execute powers of attorney, and it enables others condu to conduct financial affairs on their behalf. They have no effect on healthcare whatsoever. These documents may have been executed outside the state in which the patient now resides, so effect in your state may be questionable. Ask to see it and carefully review it and determine whether it authorizes the agent to make healthcare decisions. But when in doubt, contact medical control. Living wills need to be preconditioned to activate. So for an example, terminal illness or irreversible coma. It spells out exactly what kind of treatment the patient wishes. The health care power of attorney is often called a surrogate, and they are uh, surrogates in decision making. So a surrogate is a legally obligated to make decisions as a patient would want. Um, and they have discussed these decisions with the patient. And it has no authority until the patient has become incapacitated of making decisions. So if the healthcare surrogate decision maker is attempting to make decisions that conflict a competent patient's decision, the patient's decisions are always followed. And then you have DNRs. So these orders are also known as do not attempt resuscitation. So an advanced directive that describes which life-saving procedure should be performed if the patient's condition suddenly deteriorates. DNRs have been recognized in pre-hospital settings in the last 20 years. EMS recognizes both patients outside and inside the hospital have the same rights. Many states have DNR forms specific to EMS. Patients have the right to direct the process, and states have their own procedures for recognizing valid DNRs. Some states rely on written physician orders, and others require the patient wear a bracelet or a necklace. DNR orders expire in some states and must be renewed to remain valid. So some DNR orders do not expire, though. In some cases, the DNR order must be executed within your state by a physician licensed to practice medicine within that state. 
So be familiar with the DNR documents in your state. Okay, so withholding or withdrawing resuscitation. You need to rely on the use of common sense and reasonable judgment in deciding when to stop CPR and resuscitation efforts or to decline to initiate them. The National Association of EMS Physicians has pushed data and guidelines for termination of resuscitation of non-traumatic cardiopulmonary arrest that demonstrates the benefits of on-scene resuscitation along with when to terminate resuscitation. Medical studies show that resuscitation of medical and trauma patients is sometimes futile or may become futile. Consider the time it will take for the patient to receive care and the likelihood of survival. Each state has different laws defining the role of a paramedic in resuscitation uh, issues. In some jurisdictions, a paramedic can pronounce death. Uh, other states, only a medical investigator or physician may do so. So state laws govern your practice even if the patient is critical deceased. Some laws include guidelines for basic life support. The decision to halt resuscitation is difficult and emotional. This is especially true when dealing with a pediatric patient. Paramedics and medical professionals tend to be action-oriented. Sometimes you can do more for the grieving family than for the child who has died. So guidance and concerns about difficult resuscitation efforts come from various sources. Training and literature reviews, open discussion, and continuing education. Acquire a thorough understanding of basic consequences of EMS interventions. Okay, so let's talk about end-of-life decisions next. Treat the patient and his or her family with the utmost respect and empathy. Never question their reasoning. Understand that family of a dying patient may not know how to check a pulse, and a loved one, despite knowing that death is near, may call for an ambulance. Many people have never been with someone at the moment of their death, and your job is to provide information and respect your moral code in conflict with the patient's. So the patient's value system may be different than your own. You will encounter patients with varied cultural beliefs, so be prepared to respect a patient's lifestyle even if greatly differs from your own. Confusing scenarios when DNR paperwork is not available, so begin resuscitation efforts and then discontinue when the paperwork is confirmed. In most cases, DNR paperwork may be valid, but the patient's family may disagree with the DNR order. So avoid hostile encounters, but carry out the patient's wishes to the best of your ability and contact medical control in confusing situations or questions. The medical control physician can be a valuable resource. Medical control orders for life-sustaining treatment. So the end-of-life document. So more expansive than a DNR. It's intended to be followed by all healthcare providers and applies to patients who are in cardiac arrest. May apply to patients with impending pulmonary failure who are not in cardiac arrest yet though. So typically contain provisions addressing CPR or feeding tubes or the use of antibiotics. It applies only when the patient has lost decision-making capacity and not used in all states. So um, find out in your state. And then there's organ donation. So organ donation is a major issue in medical ethics. And organs uh, are badly needed. Many patients wait years. So major organs are not appropriate for organ donation after a prolonged hypotension or CPR. Um, the other tissues may be valuable though. In some states, they have programs allowing patients to agree to organ donation. So additional resources include workshops and EMS leaders as continuing education for paramedics. So be aware of the vital role you play in securing transplant. All right, so now we're gonna get into defenses uh, to litigation. So public awareness due to media and public education, lawsuits based on citizens' perception of delayed response and incompetence. Explain to your patients why you were delayed and explain why a procedure is difficult. Not doing so leaves you open to consequences. A patient may seek legal action, and your first defense to litigation is an open, informative, and trust-based relationship with the patient. 
when a lawsuit is filed, the paramedic and his or her employer may implement one of two defenses. Statute of limitations. So every state has laws that limit the time with which a, a lawsuit could be filed. And usually that time varies by state, but it's between one to six years. And contributory negligence. So this applies when the plaintiff has done something that contributes to his or her injuries. For an example, a paramedic encounters a patient with chest pain that appears to be uh, cardiac. Prior to administering nitrogen, the paramedic inquires about current medications. The patient does not tell the truth, and the paramedic administers medicine. The patient almost dies as a result of the interaction between the medications and files a lawsuit. In this lawsuit, the paramedic is able to assert the defense of contributory negligence. The patient failed to state he used medications, and the dosage contributed to adverse reaction to the treatment. Okay, so let's talk about Good Samaritan legislation now. And every state has some form of Good Samaritan legislation, but not every state extends protection to all the citizens and off-duty EMS personnel. So this legislation provides immunity from liability to any family member of the community who stops and helps at the scene of an emergency. The legislation was initially passed to encourage the public to help on an emergency scene. And the law provides some protection for EMS personnel who are off duty and assist in an emergency. And the law of most states limit legal protection provided. So the emergency care must be provided free of charge. An EMT or paramedic providing emergency care while on duty is not protected. And the law may help cover paramedics rendering assistance in another state though. The requirements, the requirements of Good Samaritan laws are that the person responding to the emergency must do all they can and they must not expect to function as a physician. So the paramedic is expected to deploy those skills that any other paramedic with similar training would do under the same or similar circumstances. Okay, now the next thing we're going to talk about is governmental immunity. In English law, you cannot sue the queen or the king. So such sovereign immunity has some application though in the United States. Legislation that identifies only limited types of lawsuits that can be filed against governmental agency. And they may set limited time frames in which lawsuits can be filed and they may limit the amount of money a plaintiff can recover. And then qualified immunity, so governmental immunity does not cover civil rights violations. Lawsuits have been filed against public sector paramedics. An example would be an EMS personnel improperly restraining a patient or using excessive force. Another example would be conduct that deviates from the standard of care where civil rights violation is said to occur. And paramedics working or volunteering for public agencies may have qualified immunity. So this does not apply though to tort cases. Employment law and the paramedics. So important laws affecting their relationship with their employer. Becoming involved in a legal issue regarding your employment is more likely than being sued by the patient. So relationships with employer and employee involve a complex complexity of state and federal laws and uh, regulations. So have a basic understanding of these laws. And now let's talk about the ADA, which is the American with Disabilities Act. It's a federal law. It's adopted to protect qualified persons with disabilities from being discriminated against in employment. And it applies to all employers with a minimum of 15 employees, possible state law protection for employees working for smaller employers, and it applies to all aspects of employment. So hiring, promotions, training, salary, benefits, and termination. The misconception though that employers must hire disabled employees not qualified for the job. Qualifications for protection. So they have a physical or mental disability that impairs one or more major life activities such as hearing, seeing, walking, or speaking. And they possess the basic qualifications of, of the job and be able to perform the essential functions of the job adequately without or with reasonable accommodations. Inquiries and accommodations. So an employer may not inquire about an applicant's disability or require a medical exam until a job offer has been made. 
If a disabled person could perform a job using reasonable accommodations, the employer may be required to provide and pay for the cost of these accommodations. No requirement for giving reference to a person with a disability, and this requires an uh, employer make employment decisions based on reasons that are unrelated to the disability. And decisions based on the applicant or employee being capable of performing the essential functions of the job. Next, we're going to talk about Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. And this prohibits discrimination in employment based on race, color, religion, gender, national organ, origin, or sexual discrimination. It provides protection against sexual harassment in the workplace and applies to all aspects of employment, including recruiting, hiring, promotions, benefits, and termination. It applies only to businesses with more than 15 employees, and it's unusual for an employer to blatantly refuse to hire or promote someone based on their race, gender, religion, color, or national origin. Successful claims involve the identification of a discriminatory hiring pattern. It develops over time. Violations of Title VII even when hiring practices appear normal. So an employer places a classification ad that states the qualification for the job is a minimum height requirement. The ad may seem neutral in respect to gender. This is a negative impact on the ability of women to apply. So the employer would have to prove the necessity of the height requirement. And then sexual harassment, so most common claim filed under Title VII, EMS has seen its share of sexual harassment. So there are two types of sexual harassment. There's the quid pro quo, and that's when a person in authority attempts to exchange work-related benefit for sexual favors. And then there's the hostile environment. And this is when the agent or employer uh, creates or allows to continue an offensive practice related to sex that makes it uncomfortable or impossible for an employee to continue working. Sexual harassment can occur between any combination of sexes. Most claims fall into the category of hostile environment. And there is no presence, uh, definition, precise definition in the law for sexual harassment court decisions have identified a number of circumstances that can be considered harassment, so sexual jokes or sexually offensive photographs, unwanted sexual advances or inappropriate and unwelcome touching or kissing. All employers have an obligation to prevent sexual harassment and uh, investigate any and all claims appropriately and promptly. An employer should provide training to all new employees and employees on an annual basis. Additional federal laws dealing with discrimination. So there are several federal laws that prohibit various types of discrimination in the workplace. There's the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. And this is an illegal to discriminate against pregnancy, childbirth, or any medical condition relating to pregnancy. And it was adopted in 1978 as an amendment to Title VII. And then there's the Equal Pay Act of 1963. And it's illegal to pay different rates of pay to men and women. And there's the Age Discrimination Act of 1967. So it prohibits persons who are 40 years of age or older from discrimination based on age. And it applies to businesses with 15 more employees. And then there's state laws. So they deal with discrimination in the workplace. State laws address the same issues covered under federal laws. And uh, they may apply whether or whether or not there are 15 or more employees. So become familiar with laws of your state. All right, and then there's the Family Medical Leave Act. So it was established in 1993. It grants employees to take up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave per year under certain circumstances. It applies to employers with at least 50 employees, and it covers those who have worked for the employee for at least 12 months. So this uh, allows leave to deal with the medical condition for employee or family for birth or adoption of a child in states' uh, own versions of F FMLA. So they have their own versions and it may provide the employee with more rights than the federal law and may apply to employers with fewer than 50 employees. Okay, and next there's OSHA. We're wrapping this up, um, OSHA. So this is uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration 
it's a federal agency that regulates safety in the workplace. States may enforce regulations tighter than those set by OSHA, and states may not make regulations more lenient, though. So OSHA was enacted in 1970, and all employers have several basic responsibilities, and they have to comply with OSHA standards and provide all employees with a safe workplace free of hazards. And then to warn employees if there are potential hazards to ensure that employees are provided with appropriate safety equipment. Healthcare employers have additional responsibilities, so to develop an exposure plan, develop training programs, uh, an annual refresher training, make the hepatitis B vaccine available. And OSHA regulations and standards are challenging though, so be familiar as possible with these changes. Thousands of EMS agency employees sustain injuries and illness each year, and you share an obligation to do all you can to avoid these injuries. Okay, and so uh, the second to last thing we're going to talk about is the Ryan White Act, and this is a federal law that provides certain safeguards and protections for healthcare workers who are potentially exposed to certain designate, um, designated diseases. So they have been established by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and they include HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, hepatitis B, meningitis, diphtheria, hemorrhagic fevers, plague, and rabies. It contains several provisions. So it states that hospitals and emergency response employees are required to establish a notification system to be used when exposure occurs. Employers must appoint a designated infection control officer to handle exposures and to assist all employees who have been exposed. Notification of infection control officer of possible exposure to the infectious disease and the infectious control officer will be aware of any state specific laws relating to infectious disease exposure. Okay, and finally, in conclusion, there's the National Labor Relations Act and many paramedics are employed by EMS uh, services that are not unionized. Employees have elected to have a union represent them as a collective bargaining agent for purposes of negotiating issues such as compensation, benefits, and work conditions. This law is also known as the Wagner Act, and this is a primary law establishing the rights of union and union workers this law regulates unfair labor practices by employees, and employees have a wide range of rights that which they should be familiar. Each state has its own set of laws, and in some states, the right to work laws do not allow employer or union to require you to join a union as a condition of being hired or retained on the job. Other states may require you to join the union within a certain time period after you are hired. Okay, so this concludes the lecture for Medical, Legal, and Ethical Issues, Chapter 4, and we hope that you've enjoyed it. If you have, subscribe to the channel because we'll be releasing the rest of the chapters shortly. Thank you.